in the world happens in the Bible Belt here uh, in the Carolinas. And so even though we live here, there'd be a lot of people that would not understand nor know the answer to what is the local church. So I'm going to give you five quick things about the local church. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this quick because you were kind enough to make a meal uh, to, to celebrate pastor appreciation for brother, me and brother Jesse. And uh, I'm not going to keep you from that. We sure don't want it to get cold. But what is a local church? Well, first of all, a local church is a group of Christians. We're the church. It's not this building, as beautiful as this building is. It's a building. Uh, you can go not far down the road here and turn down Main Street in Mooresville, and you'll see a church building. It's no longer a church. It's a Mexican restaurant. And it's good. Amen. That's my favorite food, Mexican. And it's good. But that used to be a church. Building. It's a building. So if we depart this building and we cease to be, it'll be used for something. You can sell the property, sell the building. Some would move in here. They'd adapt things. And they'd, they'd make something else out of it. It's a building. We're the church. The Christians. Born again, bought by the blood believers. So what is the church? The local church. Well, it's a place where we... Born again, bought by the blood believers, where we rather regularly gather together. We have a local place that we come here within this building, our church, and we gather together for a purpose. And we'll talk about that in a moment. It's also a place where the congregation, you, me, the people of West Corinth Baptist Church, where we come together and we, we exercise our rights of affirmation and confirmation. What do I mean? I mean we hold one another accountable. Right? If Brother Doug misses two or three weeks, we're going to be asking where he's at. And if he says to me, well, I just didn't feel like coming, he's about to get a discussion he didn't want to have. Amen? Because I'll be right up front and honest with him. And so we, we hold each other accountable. We make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, living like we're supposed to be living, because we are representing West Corinth Baptist Church. When we leave here today and close the doors and lock the doors, whatever time that might be, and we go out into the world, you're carrying West Corinth Baptist Church out there with you. It's not this building, it's you. I'll promise you this, nobody doesn't come to our church because of the building. If they're mad not coming, it's because of somebody. Now, I don't know if anybody's doing that. I'm just saying. We're the church. We're the church. We are also a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. People see Christ through us in our lives. And lastly there, we use the preaching of the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God, and the ordinances that we uh, upkeep to achieve all the purposes that I just mentioned. That's what the local church is. So what is the purpose? That's my second question. What is the purpose of the local church? I'm going to give you four things real quick. Number one, evangelism. It's to take the word of God and get it to a lost and dying world that others could know Jesus in the same way we do as Lord and Savior. That others could have, have the same hope that we do. That others could know what it means to be born again, to be saved from our sins. Evangelism, nurturing, helping others within our church. That's what we did yesterday. Uh, I talked to my sister last night, my mother last night, with tears in their, in their voice. They both said, I don't know how we'll ever repay those people. Well, I said, you don't. And the only way you can is by helping someone else. That's how we do it. It's called that, it's that pay, pay forward thing. Right? You ever be part of that? <laughs> I'm going to tell on myself real quick. I went through a restaurant drive through the other day. I hadn't ordered hardly anything, very little. Uh, I think we just got something to drink. I don't even remember where we was at. It wasn't around here. And the girl said, your order's already been paid for by the car in front of you. They started it. Would you like to pay for the one behind you? I said, how much did they order? Because it was a van behind me. If they got 15 people in there, then this chain is broken. 
But it wasn't, and she said, it wouldn't have been much more than what my, I said, sure, I'll pay it. It cost me more than it would have for mine, but that's okay. But if it had been 15 people, it would have been a broken chain right there, I'm telling you. So I'm just being honest. Now, you might, you, you say, well, you should have done it. Well, would you have done it? Now, yeah, be honest. Amen. I didn't start it, but I can sure finish it. Amen. So let me move on. <laughs> Nurturing. <laughs> fellowship. We come together to fellowship, right? We need one another, church, whether we realize it or not. We need one another. We need fellowship. We need to be around like-minded believers to gain strength that we can go into the world and, and stand true for the cause of Christ. And last of all, what, uh, what is the purpose of the church? It's for worship. We come here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We, you say, well, I can do that anywhere. Yeah, you can. But we're instructed to come to the house of God. We're instructed in the word of God, commanded to come to the house of God to worship him. That leads me to my third question, and then after that we'll get to the message. And I will be quick. So, what is the local church? What is the purpose of the local church? And now, what does the local church do for me? That question has been asked of me many times. And I'm going to start by saying that's a selfish question. What can the church do for me? I know I've told most of you this. Uh, uh, when my son Clinton, when uh, they had to move to Greenville, South Carolina, uh, his job took him down there. And so him and his bride went down there. And that's where the, the family is. And uh, he said, Dad, we're struggling to find a church. He said, we can't find another church. I'd been his only pastor his whole life. He said, we can't find another church like West Corinth. And I said, well, first of all, you don't need to be looking for another West Corinth. We're our own church. But I said, when you go to find a church and look for a church, I said, do not ask what the church has to offer you. You ask what you can do for the church. And if you'll go in with that mindset of how can I help the church, how can I benefit the church, then it'll make it a whole lot easier for you to find a church. Outside of that, find you a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. And everything else will work its way out. But so many times, people are looking for what it can do for them. But what does it do uh, for me? Well, it allows us to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Amen? Think about that. We're witnessing and working for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What greater calling is there? Something that transcends us and who we are. And it'll go beyond our lives. We're part of the local church. It also means that we've got a support group. If anybody in this church has a problem or has trouble, the others will rally around to help them. Whether it's uh, physically, whether it's financially, whether it's prayerfully, or all of the above. This church will rally around you. Where else are you going to find that? That's being part of a local church. And last of all, but not least, which I already spoke about, it allows us to uphold God's command. He said, forsaking not the assembly of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. We're supposed to gather together in God's house. It's what we do, amen? So with all that said, I was going to preach on this thought, we should appreciate and love our church. I do. I do not take my church for granted, because I've been in a lot of churches uh, throughout the years. I've pastored about four different churches, one of which we, we passed on the way through. I looked up, didn't look like they had any damage to the church uh, as we were coming uh, out and coming through Cane Creek. It sits up on a hill, so they had no water damage. Uh, didn't look like any trees were down. I pastored that church for about four years and uh, resigned it to move down here. And so uh, I, I'm thankful for my church. I love my church. And when, you, when you're part of other churches and you're in other churches and you see what we have here, you would agree with Sister Mildred. How blessed is our church? I mean, can you find any better singing than what we just heard? I don't think so. I just don't think so. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, we got a great choir leader. He just, our, our choir is filled full of not professionals, but normal people. And yet when they come together for the glory of God and they jail, it sounds absolutely heavenly. It does to me. I'd rather hear them sing as anybody, anybody else or any other group that I know of. And so I love my church. And I'm going to give you some quick things this morning. And I'm going to make sure I don't go past. What have I got? I got 23 minutes. And I'll try to do it in 22. So bear with me as we go. 
So we should appreciate and love our church. Do you love your church? Do you appreciate your church? I believe you do. I believe our church does. I believe many within our church uh, that sit on the pews each and every week, our members, they, they understand how blessed we truly are and how fortunate we are. Church, you are my family. You'll have to be today. Uh, it's past appreciation, so normally they'll ask me, well, how many from your family you got coming? Well, my mother's been with me two weeks. She went home Friday. I can't ask her to come back. My sister's unable to travel right now. I can't ask her to come down. Clinton's got things at his church he's got to do. He can't be here. Jonathan's in Wilmington. You're look and Karen's sick. You're looking at my family. You're my family, though. Amen? And I mean that. You're, you're my family. I think of this church uh, as family. So anyway, with that said, the local church. We're living in a day and a time where the local church and the church in general is under attack. Would you agree with me with that? I believe it is under attack. Organized religion, uh, the belief in the Word of God, uh, the, the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, it's under attack even here within our country. We know it is in other parts of the world. I give the statistics the other day, and I don't remember what they were. I can't remember right now. It's been a couple months ago. But of the number of Christians, it was in the thousands uh, that have been martyred, uh, martyred in, south, uh, in the south part of Africa, uh, over the last few years, thousands of Christians simply saved or simply uh, uh, killed because they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they would not renounce Him. The church is under attack. And even when it's not under attack, our world, our government, uh, many things are teaching that the, the church is really not needed anymore. You know, when we went through that whole COVID thing, one of the first things they did was shut down the churches. Amen? Uh, shut down the churches. Uh, that was one of the first things. While they continued to go to the restaurants, continued to do all the other things, uh, they wanted to shut you and I from coming to the house of God. Many believe that the church is just not necessary anymore, that our world has progressed, our country's progressed, and the time has gone by, and the time of the church is behind us, and it's just not necessary anymore. Can I say to you this morning that it is more necessary than anything else or organization on the face of the earth? The church... The church was established some 2,000 plus years ago. The New Testament church I'm talking about. And we need the church in our lives. I won't go into detail, but uh, I had a text conversation. First of all, I hate text conversations. That get lengthy. If you got something, just tell me in a few words and it requires a very small response, I'm in. But if it's something that's going to require an hour of my time going back and forth, call me. I don't like that. For number one, you can't read into a text. You can't read what somebody's saying. You don't have the fluctuation in your voice. You can't tell the, the thought process behind it. So call me. But I had this text uh, conversation for about 45 minutes the other night uh, with someone. And uh, I could, I don't want to go into any details. But let's just say they were saying some things that just weren't right just weren't right, and I could tell they were mad, upset at God, blaming God for the things that had occurred in their life, and to the point where, where you got, if you know me, you know I'm very cut and dried, I'm very blunt and to the point, and I don't sugarcoat things. And my response is simply, you can't blame God for the bad choices you make in this life. And things that happen to us are because of our bad choices. The things that were being talked about were not God's will. They were come apart by bad choices. And not just the person I was speaking to, but other people. Bad choices. We make bad choices. We live with the consequences. We can't blame God for that. Conversation ended. That's the way it works. I did tell them I loved them. I wanted the absolute best for them. But we just can't do that. We just simply can't do that. So many believe the church is just not necessary. But the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 3.15, I'm going to read for you this morning. 1 Timothy 3.15, the Bible said, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the, which is the church of the living God, listen, and pillar and ground of the truth. So is the New Testament church necessary? 
Well, uh, Paul said to young Timothy here, he tells him that it is the pillar and ground of the truth. How much truth do you think you hear in today's time on TV, on the news stations, about anything? The truth is right here, church. You want to know the truth? Right here it is. It is the pillar and the ground of truth. It is what we will be judged by, the Word of God, according to the very scriptures that are within. It is the local church where we come together. It is the local church where we come and we learn about heaven and hell and we learn about God and His plan of salvation. We learn about the Lord Jesus Christ and how He came to this earth and lived sinless and died at the hands of an angry mob and rose again the third day victorious over death, hell, and the grave. We learn that at the church. The church. The church is relevant. Jesus said... In he, or I shouldn't say Jesus, Paul said in his uh, writings to the Ephesians 5.25, he said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, listen, and gave himself for it. Christ thought the church was important enough that he died for it. Should you and I not think it's important enough to attend? Let me back up the scripture I read a minute ago. He said, but if I tarry long, Paul said, listen, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, where? In the house of God. Now, if you're going to learn how to behave yourself in the house of God, would you not suppose you should be in the house of God? I'm glad I got a church to come to, amen? I love our church. I don't want this to be negative, by the way. I thought for sure this would come off as being happy, and now you look like I've stepped on your foot. <laughs> Amen. So Christ loved the church enough to die for it. We should the same. I'm going to give you some points real quick, and uh, maybe someday we'll look at them in, in, in more detail. But why should we love our church? Why do I love our church? Well, I'm going to give you some things about our church. Number one, it's very distinctive. I mean, it's set apart from every other organization on the face of the earth. Our church. Number one, because of the Creator. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 18, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter. And we talked about his script the other day. I want you to listen again. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, which is the, the doctrinal foundation that the Lord Jesus Christ had given the apostles. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Now listen. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm going to say what I said a few weeks ago, because we got some faces here that didn't hear it. When the Bible says that, see, we get in our mind that, that now the church is on defense and the gates of hell, and hell's coming upon the church, and we can fight it off, and they're not going to come in on us. That's not what it says. Read it again and read it slow. The Bible says, again, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, we're talking about the gates of hell. So if, if you put up a gate at your home, what are you doing? You're trying to keep somebody out, right? You're trying to keep bad people from coming in. You're trying to secure your home if you put a gate up. Well, this is the gates of hell, not the gates of heaven. This is the gates of hell. In other words, uh, they're on defense, church. We're on the offense. We don't have to run and hide from the devil. We don't have to run and hide from hell itself. We're on the offense. We're marching forward, carrying the sword of God, and we're doing God's business. And the Bible says the very gates of hell can't prevent us from doing that business. We're busting through. We're on the offense, not the defense. The church should be moving. The church should be on the offense. We love our church. We should love our church. We're very distinctive. Not only that, because Christ is the head of the church. Now you can go to many other religions and you can go back and you can point back and you find one man that started that religion. And you know where you find that one man today? Dead in a grave somewhere. Buddha, Muhammad, I don't care who it is. They are dead in the grave. You can go there and their bones are buried. They buried my Savior. Three days later he arose. I've been in that tomb. I've stood in that tomb. He's not there, church. He's risen. You can trace the church back, and he is the creator of the church. He is the head of the church. It's not me. 
It's not you. It's not the association. Christ is the head of the church. He is the head. But not only that. He is the foundation. The Bible tells us that he is the foundation stone in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, or rather 3.11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. If what we're doing here this morning is not built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's wrong. And it ought to be scrapped. And you can take it down to the YMCA, which I don't have a problem with, or you can take it to the Moose Lodge, or take it to any other organization. But if it's going to be in the church, it must be built on the Lord Jesus Christ. It must honor Him. It must glorify Him. If it doesn't, we're wrong. We're absolutely wrong. I'm trying to move on. But not only that, is our church distinctive? Our church distinctive in its mission. The Bible says in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man is coming to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, most organizations, most uh, any kind of club or organization, they promote themselves. They promote themselves and they try to get up in the ranks and in the leadership. We're, not, we're just the opposite. We don't promote ourselves. We promote the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that we push forward. Not us, but we have been left behind to continue the work that he started, church. We are the hands and the feet of Christ, and we should do the work that he's already started. And we shouldn't quit. And the other good thing about our church is it's eternal. Let me read you a scripture there out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, listen, eternal in the heavens. We're part of the local church. I'm a member here at West Corinth Baptist Church. I'm part of this local assembly, part of this local church. But I'm also part of the big church. And the big church, now this building, will go away one day. We know it will. Because God's going to wrap this dirt ball in fire one day. This building will disappear one day. But the true church, the one I'm part of, you're part of, you're saved by the grace of God, this true church will last for an eternity. Nothing else will. It's going to last for an eternity. I've got to move. But another great thing about our church is we have our own personality. We might, we might have the same uh, beliefs. Maybe even some of the same characteristics as other churches, but we're completely different. We've got our own personality. We're made up of a, a very large group of people or a very uh, distinct group of people with different backgrounds, different uh, geographical backgrounds, different financial backgrounds. We come together. We are very, very distinctive in that, but we have our own personality. And I hope it's a good one. I don't think anybody can come to our church and leave and say they hadn't been welcomed or felt unwelcome and people aren't friendly. Uh, from, day I, from the day one, 22 years ago, when I came into this church, it's the most friendly church I'd ever been a part of and seen. Uh, we greet people at the back door. You come in, you sit down. People are going to shake your hand until it's tired. And when you leave, people speak to you again and welcome you back. If they don't, you let me know. Amen. We want to be a friendly, welcoming church. Our church has its own unique personality. We have the way that we worship. We have the songs that we sing. And I do believe we're, uh, what's the word I want there? Balanced. We're, we're pretty balanced in what we do. You can find some people that don't like our church. You can find some that love our church. You could find some that love me and some that don't like me. You could leave and go here and you could find some that have come and said, they're too liberal for me. Or you could find some that says, they're too conservative for me. When you've got them talking on both sides, you're probably where you ought to be. The Bible said in the book of Luke, I wrote the scripture down here, Luke 6, 26, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. We've probably got a pretty good balance. But I've got to be honest, my goal is not to be liberal but you know me, that ain't going to happen. My goal is not to be liberal, but my goal is not to be ultra-conservative. My goal is to be biblical. 
And we can be biblical here at our church without getting caught up in all the dogmatic things that occur on both sides. We need to make sure that what we're saying and doing within our church is biblical. We're teaching biblically in our Sunday school rooms. We're teaching biblically in our programs. We're teaching biblically from the pulpit that our songs bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. If a song touches your feet before it does your heart, probably not a song should be here. Amen? And we have good singing. I told you I'd rather hear our choirs than anything. We need to make sure that what we do is biblical. It's all that matters. All that matters is we line up with the Word of God. Some are going to like it, some aren't. That's okay. Christ didn't please everyone either, did He? He sure didn't. So let me move on. We just got to believe in the book and preach the book. Another thing about our church here that I, that I truly believe is I believe for the most part that our church is of one mind. I do not mean, as I've said before, if, you've ever, if you were a Star Trek person and they had the Borg. Now most of you probably don't know what that is. But the Borg was a group of people that were plugged into one mainframe, one mindset, and they all operated as one. We're not like that. You, you have your opinions, you have your, mind, uh, you have your mindset on things, but that doesn't mean that we're not of one mind. We agree on a lot of things. I believe everyone in here is saved by the grace of God. We can say that we love our Savior with all our heart, mind, and soul. Amen? We may not always act like it, but we love our Savior. I believe we love one another. Even when we get on one another's nerves sometimes. Maybe we have a disagreement, but we still love one another. How many is married? Ever had a disagreement with your spouse? You don't quit loving them just because you have a disagreement. We still love one another. Amen? Absolutely. We still love one another. We have love for each other. I believe that we're in one mind when it comes to sinners. We have a love to see lost people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have programs set up to reach lost people. We preach the plan of salvation. We teach the plan of salvation. It is our will. It's God's will rather that all men should come and be saved. And that should be our goal also. And I believe we all have that mindset. The fourth point I wanted to make was that our church is compassionate and giving. That was on display yesterday. I wasn't going to ask people to go up and help with my family. There's plenty of work to be done. But it was done. And you'll never know what it meant to them. The Bible says in Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now when I say what I'm about to say, I don't mean we can't do better. We can always do better. But I do believe that we minister in all three of these areas. When it comes to Jerusalem, that's talking about the immediate area, right there where they were at. And it's easy sometimes or maybe I should say that's the hardest sometimes to witness is the people right around you. We try to do that through Sunday school, through the, uh, the preaching services on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, through our children's church in the back, through our senior program, through Parents' Night Out, through the men's group, through the women's group, through the different things we have in this church. We try to minister to our local community. We try to reach people. That's what Jerusalem means. But then when it speaks of, and in all Judea and in Samaria, it's talking about more of our home-based missions that reach a little further out. And we try to do that. You know, we just went and, uh, and took a bunch of gifts and food to the Baptist children's home. Uh, each year it seems like we're helping the, uh, uh, the uh, pregnancy crisis center, uh, the hurricane relief that's been taken up. I, I guess that there's been at least five or six at least Big trailer loads of stuff that has been taken to the mountains. Connections have been made to get other things up there. Our church is a compassionate and giving church. Not just within the walls, but outside the walls. And of course, if you want to go one step further, uh, the Bible said, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, we support missionaries around the world both through the association as well as some directly from our church. But we are sending the gospel message through out the world helping to send that and our services just like this morning can be watched online anywhere there's internet it can be watched around the world live or they can watch it later uh, with YouTube so we're trying to take advantage of some of the modern 
conveniences, helps to share the gospel. Even though a lot of that stuff can be used for vile and terrible and vulgar things, if we could use it for God's glory, we should do so and get the word out to people. Last thing that I don't want to see our church become is content and complacent. And that is so easy to do. It's so easy to become happy with the status quo. Everything's good. You know, uh, we, we've got good people. We've got people coming. Uh, preacher, aren't we big enough? No. No. Anything that's not moving forward is dying, church. Anything that's not moving forward is dying. I have planted numerous people in our graveyard and other graveyards around here in my tenure. Planted numerous people in the graveyard. And if we don't reach out to a world and bring new people in and get people saved by the grace of God, the day will come. West Corinth will cease to exist. We must keep moving forward. We should not be content with where we're at, content to be in a rut. We need to have a desire. Four things, and I'll close. This is Kathy, probably a good time. Four quick things. We should have a desire to grow. Number one, in grace. That we would grow closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would grow uh, closer one to another in our grace and, and outlook for the lost and dying world. We should also try to grow in numbers. I don't count numbers. I don't want to be like David, number Israel. So I, I, it's, it, let me say I'm not driven by numbers. We want to see our church grow, but it's not the numbers that, that drive us just for the sake of numbers. We want to see people saved. I want to see people give their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to feel that baptismal pull up more often than we do. Amen? That's what I want to do. We should also desire to be more dedicated. Dedicated. That's a personal decision each one of you have to make is in the dedication that you have, not only to the Lord, but to the local church. But we should desire to be more dedicated. And the last thing is, if we put all those things together, if we're going to grow in grace and grow in numbers and grow in dedication, it can only come through prayer, witnessing, and the giving of our time and funds to the local church. I said all that just simply to say I am very blessed to be part of West Corinth Baptist Church. You elected me as the pastor almost 22 years ago, and it has been some of the best days of my life. I've raised my family here. I've gone through good times and bad times. We've seen new people come, and we've buried some of our saints. But my time at West Corinth Baptist Church is something I cherish because I do not know when my last service will be. I do not know when God would call me home or call me out or you throw me out. I don't know. Any of the three could occur today. I do not know. But it has been the best years of my life. I love my church. You are my family and always will be. Let's pray. Father. I thank you for the time that we've had here together this morning, Lord, and I know today's a different day, and I struggle with days like today when, when the church sort of puts us in the spotlight, Lord, and they honor us, and Lord, I just don't feel worthy. Lord, you've been so good to me and my family and so good to our church, and Lord, I'm so thankful for those of our church that have shown their love and not just said I love you, Lord, but have shown it by their actions over the years and how good they have been to me my family so Lord however much time we might have here left whether it be at this church or on the earth Lord we just thank you and I praise you and I want you to receive the honor and you to receive the glory Lord I pray you bless every home that's here and represented today Lord I pray you bless our visitors that they might come back another time I just love you Lord and we love our church in Jesus' name, save that one that's closest to hell. Amen.